Hi, this is Sheb. Welcome to the Faith Colloquium Podcast. Today, my guest is Amy Davison. Amy is doing a PhD in philosophy at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And today we're talking about raising children with religious autonomy. So Amy, thanks for talking with me. Oh, thanks for having me. The first question I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, what's an example of bad religious autonomy when it comes to raising children? I think when it comes to raising kids, an example of bad religious autonomy is is basically no religious autonomy. The child is sort of kept within, you know, a Christian bubble to where they aren't uh, either acquainted with other worldviews, cultures, philosophies. And so the only choices they have are the ones that the parents have sort of curtailed uh, to their own beliefs and given to the children. So these kids grow up and then they and end up going out of the house and going to college and all of a sudden they're acquainted with all these different beliefs and ideologies and they they kind of don't know what to do with them. They've never interacted with them before. Some are are very appealing. You know, they appeal to our feelings and and desires and so they they don't really know how to interact with them. So some of them will some of them will do okay and uh, and others will just sort of crumble underneath them. And so I think when it comes to our kids, you know, the best thing we can do is to sort of give them this experience within the home to where they're able to interact with these beliefs beliefs and, uh, and to be able to, to grow within sort of the safety of the home. Okay. So I've had Christian friends who have experienced that, what you're talking about, right? Their parents kind of raised them in this one kind of specific way of thinking and didn't expose them to different ways of thinking about ideas. And so their response to that was, you know, I think that I, I'm not going to tell my children anything about the faith. I'm not going to tell them anything about Christianity. And I really want to just leave it up to them. Um, so, we were talking about religious autonomy. Like, it's it's really taking religious autonomy seriously, right? I think kids should not be told all of these religious beliefs at such a young age. That's going to mess with them. It's going to screw them up. What do you think about that? You know, I think that's just kind of this sort of natural but overreaction, you know, especially if you are in sort of a, you know, a conservative environment where this is all you've been given and you feel sort of, uh, you know, sort of jaded by it. Like, oh, I didn't hear any of this other stuff. So my kids, I'm going to do things totally differently. I'm uh, I'm just going to let them sort of be a free spirit. Uh, they can decide for themselves. But really, that doesn't sort of solve the problems that they experience themselves. You know, as parents, we are called to train up our children. So we are fully within our rights as parents to evangelize our kids. And I think that's what I would sort of encourage people to do as they're raising their children is you want them to think critically. You want to develop these skills. You want them to learn of other cultures. But that doesn't mean that we have to remain silent. Yeah. So you've written about this case, Mozart versus the Board of Education. Can you talk about what happened there? Yeah, so it's a really interesting case. And so I was so thankful that, you know, we're in this digital age. I can actually read the uh, the court files. Um, and so when I started looking at the case, it started out with t- sort of two parents, uh, Vicki Frost and then the Mozarts. The Mozarts were a separate family. They sort of led the trial themselves. But there was a group of about five families that ended up coming on board. And what happened is um, this mom had gotten a hold of her sixth graders book and she started reading through it. And she didn't like some of the stories that were in there, just, you know, regular reader stories. I believe some of the children were capable of doing telepathy. And so she was very uncomfortable with that. So she took her child's book and spent the next 200 hours researching and and digging into these stories and basically picking out every sort of um, philosophy that was just contrary to Christianity. And it just upset her. She didn't like that her child was exposed to these these sorts of themes. And so she ended up speaking to other Christian parents who uh, had the same views. The Mozarts, they had an eighth grader and they didn't like the stories that he was reading either. And so they decided to sue the school. So that way their kids could be pulled out of class. They wanted them to be removed from from any classroom discussion that had contrary views to Christianity, even just even just regular dialogue about maybe a subject, they didn't want their children talking about it at all. They didn't want their children reading any sort of story that uh, they deemed contrary to their Christian beliefs. And they felt that the school should not only accommodate their belief, but some of the parents pulled their children out and put them in a Christian private school. And they felt that the school board should pay for their children to be there because the uh, the curriculum was so offensive. So, these parents have these children in, in public school, right? 
Yes. And they are getting these books and are really put off by what they're reading, even to the point of pulling their children out and suing the school board. And you don't think that's the right way to go about it? No, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, it definitely was uh, it was ambitious. And I think there are cases in which, you know, yeah, they, they should, you know, go against the, the school board and say, hey, this is wrong. And I even cover that in my paper of different instances. But in this case, it was it was a huge overreaction. I mean, the, the stories the kids were reading, um, the eighth grader, he was reading Diary of Anne Frank. And there is a scene in there where Peter sort of gives this this hopelessness. He just has this hopeless view of, of society. Society. And I mean, it's understandable considering their condition. And Anne responds with, um, well, I just wish you believed in something, not necessarily orthodoxy, just something. And so, you know, the parents were just outraged that that, uh, you know, they would be these children would be reading these other kids talking about just believing in anything, you know, is what she interpreted it to be. And and it's like, no, she was trying to he was hopeless. She was trying to offer encouragement. And so I think when it comes to stories, you know, we have to be careful, you know, not to to go sort of like this uh, honey badger going after these things. It's OK, well, what's actually being said? Let's have some good discussion about it. And so and there were other comments to um, Leonardo da Vinci was talked about that his paintings were so beautiful. It was like they're painted by the hand of God. And so uh, Vicki Frost kind of freaked out and said, well, that's uh, futuristic supernaturalism. You're saying that da Vinci was the hand of God. And it's no, no, that's not what is meant. You know, we have to we have to look at the context. Right. So you don't like that way of, of how they approached it. But you also think that there's a kind of a healthy way to raise your children. So you say it was not the introduction of contrary beliefs that posed the greatest threat to the child's face, but the lack of arguments offered in response to them. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Yes. And, you know, it's so interesting because just today I was reading an article written by the Family Research Council, and the the title of it really struck me. It was, you know, if you if you leave your children in public schools, you're basically going to cost them their souls, okay. meaning that that if, you know, your, your kids are in these schools, they're going to be exposed to these contrary philosophies and doctrines that, uh, you know, this liberal worldview that's just seeping into our schools. And so you have to pull your kids out because if you don't, you're, you know, they're on the, the fast track to condemnation. And it's, uh, I, you know, I just, I can't get on board with that because when you look at, um, it was the Pew Research Council in 2016, they surveyed all these folks that had ended up walking away from the faith. And statistically speaking, your Christian high schoolers, there's 66% of them are going to walk away from the faith by the time they get to college. And this Pew Research survey that they had done, they found that a lot of these kids, the reason they walked away from the faith were intellectual struggles. They didn't have the answers to questions that they had. They didn't know how to look through the eyes of a Objectivity. They didn't think there was objective truth at all. They didn't know how to wrestle with this stuff. So the problem wasn't how they grew up. It was that they didn't get the answers that they were wanting. Hmm. And I think sometimes within Christian households, I mean, we've got a lot of opportunities, you know, between Christian homeschooling, private schools, there's Christian sports leagues, cheer, Sunday school. You know, you can schedule every moment of your child's day to do something that has Jesus at the center. And that's great. But if that's the only thing that you're doing, then they're not going to be able to sort of discern the other philosophies that are out there to where if they're not exposed to alternative worldviews, you know, they're they're going to be at a disadvantage. And a lot of these folks, when they were surveyed, it, it was these intellectual struggles. They they didn't have the answers, so they just gave up. It depends, again, on on the parents. You know, it, the article that I had read today, you know, they talked about, well, you got to pull your kids out. And it's like, okay, you know, if you feel like you have to, if God, you feel God's calling you to pull them out, okay, but what else are you doing? Are you are you giving them um, the arguments uh, against some of these claims that they're experiencing, that they're hearing, that they're learning? Because if you're not doing that, then then you're missing out. And also just, um, you know, I have kids myself. I We did homeschooling um, for a while and they're in public school now. I also think that, you know, if we have this mass exodus of Christian kids from public school, then, you know, they're, they're missing out on ministry opportunities. Other kids in their classrooms are missing out on ministry opportunities. And the article had said that, you know, these kids who are going through these these private school, or excuse me, public schools, that they're becoming the next lawyers and doctors and teachers. And it's yes, you know, they are. So why not give your child an opportunity to shine their light to some of these kids who may not otherwise hear it? So I think it's important to keep Christian kids in public school um, because, again, they can have ministry opportunities. And, you know, for some folks, uh, they can't do the homeschooling. They can't afford private school. And so they kind of feel you kind of get this sort of guilt like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm I'm uh, letting my children suffer in 
public school and you know right there if you equip them if you tr- if you help raise them up uh, then there won't be that suffering they'll have great growth and they'll be able to minister to their peers what would you say to someone who said something like um you know i don't really want my children reading freud or marx or nietzsche or something like that because you know those guys weren't christians like and the bible is the word of God, and that's all I need to expose my children to. Like these, we know that we we can we we can dismiss all these other um, atheist philosophers because they were they they were wrong, right? And so I don't I don't need to teach my kids about them. Yeah, and I think Vicky Frost she actually said something very similar. Her her statement that really struck me as I was reading through the statements uh, throughout the um, the lawsuit was that she said her children did not have to think because the Bible had already decided for them. And I just, right. I just think that's, that's just not good. I don't think it's biblical for one. Um, and it, it also too depends on how old the child is too. So if you, if you've got a young kid, um, they're probably not going to be reading Marx, but uh, I think that, you know, as a parent, if you have your kid in public school, get involved yourself, find out what the curriculum is, and then provide uh, some balance when they get home. Hey, you know, what'd you read today? You know, if you're uncomfortable with your kid um, reading Marx, most likely they're going to be a high schooler. I think um, sort of some introspection would be good. It's like, why am I uncomfortable with this? If it's if it's because you're afraid that maybe they will agree with them, well, you know, maybe you need to provide a defense. Like, hey, what do you think of this? Why why do you think these views are correct? Um, what are some of the pitfalls here? Can we mm. see some inconsistencies? How does this best reflect reality and design and that sort? And I think if you do that, then you you won't have these fears of the sort of lack of control. Yeah. Um, someone once said to me, you can only pass on to your children what you already have. So when you're saying all this, it just makes me think like what, you know, a parent might think like, gosh, like, I don't even know what I would say to Marx. Like, I've never read Marx, you know, I haven't thought about these things. I don't feel like I can say anything. And so, I'd rather just avoid it. (laughs) Um, What do you think about that? Yeah, that sort of ostrich mentality. You know, it it can be very intimidating, especially some of the topics, you know, these kids are are wrestling with. Um, But I think we, you know, it takes some bravery. It takes some uh, some perseverance, you know, this, uh, I would rather not deal with it. Okay, that's fine. But your kid is. You can be researching these topics and sort of brush up on them enough to grasp, you know, what is the basic concepts? uh, What are some of the beliefs behind them? And then to be be able to have these good discussions, because more than likely you and your kid are going to be on par, especially if you're both learning the topic at the same time. It's good to, to, you know, journey with them, especially as they get older. You know, kids can get, especially teenagers, they can get kind of resentful of mom and dad trying to sort of talk down with them. So I think that if you start sort of transitioning into let me journey alongside you and let's discuss this stuff, I think it makes for um, sort of a good relationship opportunity between you and your kid. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, Something that I've experienced that I I felt like uh, was done badly was I, so I went to a Christian school um, in high school, but the the exposure I had to secular thinkers um, was always from a, a strong like Christian, very polemical kind of perspective. And so, it, it always kind of felt like I'm getting these guys, but only in such a way that we can just tear them down real, real easily and real quickly. And I'm curious what you would say the value is of, of maybe toning down that polemic and just like, and really letting these non-Christian thinkers speak for themselves. Um, yeah, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of presenting sides as unbiasedly, as charitably as possible, because, you know, we, we want to be treated and treat other people the way we want to be treated. So I think that even if you have just some off the wall beliefs, you know, Freud or any of those, if if you're engaging them sort of charitably, then people will not feel like you're sort of just sort of Christian, being this angry Christian, attacking them, that sort of thing. Because, you know, some kids will totally blow that off. They'll be like, oh, well, they're just, you know, being against this guy. They're not even giving them a fair chance. And so right. uh, me personally, you know, I, I prefer to go about it as, okay, so here's what they're saying. Let's look um, at the original context. Let's see why um, he believes this way. And then, you know, because I've, I've worked with some teens in high school in apologetics. It's like, okay, guys, what do you think? You know, and it's really interesting. They really respond to that because they say, okay, well, let, let's, you know, let's just look at this um, sort of 
not necessarily freely, but, you know, just look at this without this sort of uh, sarcastic, shaming tone of voice like, oh, look, right. he's not a Christian. So, you know, obviously you can ignore everything he says. It's, well, let's let's see what he has to say, because, I mean, you yeah. can have folks who you may not agree with or have, you know, totally different belief systems and they can still say something that's true. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's a value, like, regardless of, of what whoever you're talking to, you want people to 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 listen to people charitably and have some kind of intellectual humility, right? And not just be so quick to dismiss, like regardless of, of whether they're Christian or not. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think Colossians yeah. 4.6 is really good about that. Is our conversations, they're supposed to be seasoned with salt, but full of grace. I mean, we're supposed to not compromise our faith, but we can communicate it in a way that's attractive and engaging and charitable. Yeah. Yeah. And we've talked a little bit about this already, but I, I just want you to flesh it out a little bit more if, if you could. You've got, again, this great line where you say, um, Mozart effectively told their children that by accepting Christ, they no longer had to think because the Bible already provided them with the answer to situations where critical judgments or choices are exercised. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was really well said. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that came up because one of the big things that they wanted is they didn't want their children in the classroom where a viewpoint that they didn't agree with was being discussed. And um, I just thought that was that was so sad because, uh, you know, here you have these kids who are, and they all um, agreed. They said, yes, you know, the, these children, they were sixth grade through eighth grade. They said, yes, we're Christians um, and, and everything. And so uh, when their parents effectively tried to take them out of the classroom, they sort of w wanted to put their kids on autopilot or even just sort of create these sort of Stepford children that, you know, they would they would say the right things, but they and, and do the right things. But yet they didn't allow them to to interact. And I think um, I think discussion and dialogue is just this great art that, you know, with social media and the presence of cell phones, we're, we're sort of losing the art of, of discussion and humble debate. And so I think that um, when we have these kids in the classroom, we got to give them an opportunity to explain themselves because, you know, they'll be able to to have uh, great growth with discussing other people. You know, other students will bring up different viewpoints that maybe they hadn't considered. Um, there may be mistakes that these kids make, uh, which, you know, happens to all of us. But uh, through those mistakes are growth as well. And so. When we try and say that just because we're Christians, we no longer have to think because here we have this great, you know, leather bound manual, you know, we're, we're losing that art of, of the mind that, that God called us to use. I mean, we're supposed to love him with our heart and soul and minds. And if we're not using that mind, we're, we're losing sort of an act of devotion. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so uh, parents are involved in raising their children, but like Christian parents are also sending their children to Sunday school, to church, to youth groups, right? Things like this. Um, what, what kinds of thoughts did you have for local churches when it comes to things like this? So I think the churches, you know, you can uh, you can be a little more engaging, especially as kids start getting into that that third grade um, range, because by then they've heard, especially if they've been raised in the church, you know, they've heard all the Bible stories. Now they want to know more. They want to know why. And so I think churches can really do a great job of equipping their kids by starting to dive into a little more um, theology, start incorporating some apologetics. You know, why are why do we think these things? Why do we believe this is true? Um, I mean, uh, I, I love the fine tuning argument in science and that sort of thing. And, and I found that kids really respond to that. I mean, they love uh, seeing this evidence. And that was one of the things that really attracted me to apologetics is going to a stand firm conference, gosh, I think four years ago and realizing that, oh my gosh, you know, here are these questions that I've had my whole life and there's actually answers for them. That's incredible. And, uh, yeah. and you have kids who are children are incredibly wise at a very young age. And so when we can start nurturing that curiosity, that getting them excited to sort of uncover these these biblical questions, these sort of mysteries, so to speak, you know, they yearn for that. They love it. They respond to it. And um, you, I mean, you'd be surprised how deep of a conversation you can have with a third grader when you got a long car ride and you start asking them about, you know, the existence of God. Yeah, yeah. Um, something that I... I frequently think about is does like so you when you're talking about arguments for god's existence right where for me i think about someone like thomas aquinas's five ways or anselm um these great thinkers from the past and i wonder because i think because evangelicals have this distorted view of sola scriptura where they think it's just me and my bible if evangelicalism has the resources to 
helped their children with thinking through their faith um, because of how we approach scripture, how we approach tradition. We kind of have this very like narrow view of what of what kind of counts as authoritative. What What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I've seen that myself uh, within just within the church and even in school and everything. There is kind of this sort of fear of the philosophy side of things. Uh, I remember one Sunday, our um, pastor was up on on stage, you know, giving this great sermon. I was getting excited because he was starting to touch on some uh, touch on some apologetics and. Uh, he very quickly halted the sermon and said, you know, it's not it's not about apologetics. You can't argue anyone to faith. You can only love them. And I was so kind of bummed out by that, you know, being the good Baptist I was, I wanted to like write a note on the bulletin and put it in the offering plate, like, hold up a second. Right. But right, um, right. I, I think there are, uh, I think there's a bit of a fear, you know, because again, you know, it, it, it's these great arguments and they're convincing and everything. I don't think a lot of uh, sort of the evangelical church is um, equipped, you know, they, they haven't quite studied it. And so they are very sort of leery of this. Uh, it, it is very much, well, I've got the word of God. That's good enough. That's all I need. And uh, it's, it's great. You know, that's awesome. But what happens? when the person you're talking to says, well, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in, mm. in that. Then where do you go? And mm. so I think there are a lot of really great resources out there. Um, but there's still a lot of legwork involved into it. So, I mean, if you have a youth ministry and you're wanting to, you know, touch on more of the apologetic side of things, your your youth leaders and that sort of stuff, are they're going to have to do their research. And uh, I mean, it takes time. And when you have curriculums that, I mean, you can go and do one click ordering and get this, you know, great Bible curriculum. I mean, that's that's very attractive because of how accessible it is. Whereas apologetics, you know, you may have to do research, collect some sources, you know, that sort of thing. It, it takes more time and effort. And uh, I think when you factor in sort of the the unknown of apologetics, a lot of pastors still think it's it's arguing, it's fighting. And uh, that's, that's not it at all. And uh, so when you have that coupled with, you know, you may have to put some extra, um, some extra time and effort. And, you know, of course, the church board, you should review it and that sort of thing. I think people are sort of resistant to do that because you know it's it's just a lot easier just to go with the ready-made stuff yeah you said this phrase could you talk about that the that expression people don't come to faith through arguments or you can't argue people into christianity and so our job is just to love them can you explain what is is not right about that <laughs> well several things um and gregory kokel he touches on this in his book tactics which is absolutely fantastic you know if if the Holy Spirit, um, if they're not receptive to the Holy Spirit, you can no sooner love somebody to Christ than you can argue them to Christ. Mm. I mean, you can be super nice to them. You can bring them casseroles. You know, you could do all the standard, mm. uh, all the standard things you can. But if the Holy Spirit isn't there, um, if, if they aren't receptive to that, you know, it's it's not going to work. So this whole mindset of, well, we just have to love somebody to Jesus. It's yes, you know, we love them. But part of loving is, is also, you know, being available to discuss, to be accountable, to, um, you know, help train uh, train folks up to where if you've got a secular friend who's maybe struggling with problem of evil, that sort of thing, I mean, um, you've got to be open and available to, you're sort of sharing your wisdom in uh, in a loving way. So um, again, arguing, it's 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 not all about arguments, but yes, you actually can argue someone because if, if you have people who are, are struggling and you're giving uh, debates back and forth, I mean, goodness, um, who was it? Lee Strobel, as well as Jay Warner Walls. I mean, those guys uh, came to faith from from wrestling with it. They were staunch atheists and uh, through their research and, and other people, you know, coming up to them and, and, and sort of giving their case and everything, you, they ended up coming to Christ. So yes, it, both are possible. Um, but of yeah. course, if you're just, you know, going at some to try and you know prove God's right and there's there's no sort of heart in the matter there's no love it's just hey let me just show how you're wrong obviously you're going to have problems right right was there anything else uh, that you feel like was worth talking about that we haven't discussed about apologetics raising children and the local church and uh, what we can do about this yeah, I had been doing this Bible study, um, trying to figure out, uh, you know, how we should train our kids, how how we should raise them, because you know, especially our culture right now, they're they're very, you know, everybody's got to be nice and say the nice things, and it's like, how do we raise, you know, good Christian warriors? And uh, so I started researching. I noticed um, in Ephesians six, uh, you know, it's talking about how fathers should bring up their children, and I noticed it was interesting because instead of just saying um, bringing up in in instruction, um, he spoke of bringing them up in 
training and instruction. So I was like, wait a second, why is there this sort of shift now from just training? Now we've got training and instruction. So I started to do a little word search and I noticed that um, in the original uh, Hebrew, there's this word called uh, lemad, and it means to train for battle. And whenever you look in the Old Testament, in like Second Samuel and Psalms 18, when these warriors were getting ready to engage, they did this lemad, which was uh, training with the intent to put it into use. And what was so fascinating about that is when I was reading the book of Joshua, it talks about how Joshua is this great warrior. You know, they got to go into the promised land. But the when Joshua died, it said that the generation that followed him neither knew the Lord nor worshiped him. And that struck me. I was like, wait a second, what happened? We have this great man of God. And here the next generation, the kids didn't know about God. And so I started looking into it. And um, at the very beginning, when you look at Deuteronomy 4.10, when uh, God called the people to gather around the mountain, he said to train your children. And that train is lemad. It's to train them up with the intent to use. And that's what Joshua didn't do. That's what that generation didn't do. And that's what we see being modeled in Ephesians 6.4 is to train, to, to uh, not only give them the biblical answers, but to help them be able to engage in culture. And so I think when we've got our kids, we need to do this lemad style training. We need to give them the information. Uh, give them the arguments, but we also need to teach them how to dialogue well, how to have great conversation, how to understand and recognize logical fallacies. And when we do that, they have an effective apologetic engagement that they're not only able to witness to others, but they can also better wrestle with maybe doubts that they're experiencing in their own life because they they aren't stuck thinking, well, I've got this problem, but I don't know how to fix it, so I'm just going to give up. They say, well, mm. I've got this problem, you know, but I already have some research skills. Uh, let me see where some arguments are. Let, let me see where some answers are. And they can start digging into it um, because we live in a culture now that is very fast food. You know, if you don't get uh, an answer or a response right away, you know, you sort of toss it aside. And uh, we can't be that way with the faith because the faith takes uh, a lot more effort than that. And so I think for when you raise your kids, that's that's sort of the goal is train them up in a way that's practical that they can engage with um, as well as knowledgeable. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that. Oh, gosh. No, thank you. This was so much fun. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe and please share with your friends. 